Hey Bio 102, um, I'm here uh, recording for you um, a little bit about the other processes of evolution. Um, we talked earlier this week about genetic drift and today we're going to talk about um, mutation, gene flow, and non-random mating. Um, and we'll get to selection after the break. So we're gonna to start today talking about mutation, which is in some ways the least important and in some ways the most important force of evolution. Um, mutation can be defined as um, a change, a permanent change in the sequence or the structure of a gene or a chromosome. So it's a physical change to the nucleic acid, which is then in order for evolution to actually work, um, that mutation has to be passed on to offspring to the next generation. Otherwise, that um, mutation is not actually causing genetic change from one generation to the next. It's just a change in the individual. So mutation is a force of evolution in populations. However, it's not that good of one, actually. It's not very powerful. Um, it can affect the genetic com composition of a population, um, but only, as I kind of mentioned just a minute ago, only if that mutation occurs in a sex cell, so either in an egg or a sperm, and then that sex cell has to make it into the next generation. It has to be part of the um, sort of fertilized um, eggs that grow into organisms that make it into the next generation. So any mutations that occur in cells of the body that are not um, producing egg cells or sperm cells, those mutations are body or somatic mutations only and they don't contribute to evolution. Um, and the thing about mutation is that it does not actually affect gene frequencies very much. Um, it affects uh, gene frequencies on its own very slowly and very rarely. It turns out that for every 10,000 gametes produced, approximately one of those 10,000 gametes um, will have a mutation at any particular um, gene, like in the human genome that is. So in other words, um, the evolution of a particular locus, sort of the change in allele frequency at a particular locus due to mutation by itself is very slow over time. And although yes, um, it mutation can cause allele frequencies to change at an infinitesimal slow level, um, it's not a massive uh, contribution to how allele frequencies change over time. And we'll look at that in allele A1 when you get back. However, I want to make sure that you understand that mutation, even though it's very slow and very rare when considering um, it on its own, mutation is a very important evolutionary force because it's basically the only way that um, genetic variation can be introduced into um, populations. It's the ultimate source of genetic variation, as many textbooks say, and I think that's kind of a good way to put it. It's a random change that occurs to um, the genes um, in the genome, and it is it creates new alleles. So it is the source of genetic variation in on Earth, basically. So um, it's a good thing to keep in mind as well that on average, mutations are more likely to be harmful um, or neutral, and actually they're really most likely to be neutral with respect to their effects on an individual's fitness. So when you start thinking about how selection works with mutations, um, so introducing two evolutionary forces at once, mutation and selection, um, selection generally doesn't pay attention to most mutations because most mutations don't affect the phenotype. And the ones that do, most of the mutations that do affect phenotype affect them in a negative way and not in a positive way. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through various kinds of mutations. So this is, the next bit is some material from chapter 16. Um, the first thing I want to do is sort of introduce the basic, uh, what they call or what they used to call the central dogma in biology. And this is very, very straightforward. It's um, sort of 
yeah, very um, low level molecular biology. But here's the idea that there is DNA in cells, generally in the nucleus we're talking about, um, that produces a molecule, another nucleic acid that is called nucle um, mRNA. And that mRNA contains a code um, that designates um, what protein the cell should produce in each, in that cell. So um, when everything is working properly, there's a sequence of DNA that is transcribed into mRNA, which is then giving direct instructions for how a protein should be um, built. And I'll talk a little bit more about the sort of redundancy within that genetic code, but this is how it works generally. So if there's a mutation in the DNA, um, that mutation is then transcribed into the RNA um, that can cause a change in the genetic um, structure of the protein. So often the change is a silent mutation. So it can, um, even though there is a change in the instructions, that instruction does not change the product. So it might just be, a, for example, if you think about an instruction manual, it might have two different ways of saying the same thing. Um, and as long as the sort of instructions get you the final product that's the same, um, the mutation, even though it is a change, does not cause any changes in phenotypes. That's called a silent mutation. You could also get a loss of function mutation. So unlike the silent mutation, which is neutral with respect to phenotype, sometimes there are mutations that cause changes in the structure of the um, DNA, uh, cause the change in the structure of the protein such that the protein no longer works properly. So that's a mutation that is um, a non-functional protein and most often that's going to be a deleterious or harmful mutation. And finally, it's possible, very rare, that you might have a situation where a change in the DNA um, sequence causes a change in the mRNA, which causes a gain of function in the protein. So maybe this protein now has two active sites where it only had one in the original um, version. So a gain of function mutation is possible, but very unlikely. So that's overall, you're most likely going to get a silent mutation and occasionally a loss of function mutation. And once in a great, 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 great rare while, you might get a gain of function as a result of a change in the DNA. So there are a bunch of different kinds of mutations. Um, I want to talk a little bit about point mutations. So point mutations occur when there is a single change, like a change in a single um codon, a single letter um, in the DNA sequence. Um, these are probably the most common kinds of mutations that occur, and many of them are silent, as we said before, and have no effect on the phenotype. So in this case, the um, an A is placed here instead of a C um, that would was in the original um, sequence. That causes no change, though, in the instructions for producing um, an aspartame at the um, in the um, polypeptide sequence. So there's no change in amino acid sequence, even though there is a mutation that causes a permanent genetic change in the organism. This is a neutral, silent mutation that can be detected by sequencing DNA, but cannot be detected by looking at the um, physical phenotype of the cell or the organism. Another kind of uh, point mutation is a missense mutation. In this case, what happens is um, you the mutation has caused the insertion of an A instead of a T um, in this uh, segment of the DNA. And in this case, actually what happens is instead of producing ASP, the instructions now say, actually after the proline, put in valine. Um, and so it actually changes the amino acid sequence and that might cause a change in the function of the protein. It might cause um, a deleterious problem or it might not, right? A missense mutation may be deleterious, but it doesn't have to be. But what is going on here is that you get a substitution of a DNA that is incorrect. Um, it reduces, it, it changes the polypeptide, it changes the protein sequence.
Um, there are also situations where um, the instructions might be changed so that instead of the RNA saying add a series of um, amino acids, instead what might happen is that a mutation may cause the production of a stop codon or part of a code that says stop making amino acids, quit making a protein, we're done. Um, that is often called a nonsense mutation. And what happens here is that the protein basically doesn't get made at all. And that almost always is going to cause a problem in the production of the phenotype and causing a deleterious or harmful phenotype. So nonsense mutations where you have an early stop codon, that might very well often cause a, um, a negative mutation or a deleterious situation. Um, finally, frame shift mutations are those where you actually get a little bit of an insertion. You get an insertion of a um, codon um, where there wasn't be one before. And this, um, I'm not going to go into great detail about what happens here, but because um, DNA uh, transcription and translation occur in um, sort of groups of three, what happens if you just insert a single codon is that the whole reading frame shifts. So it's as if you uh, no longer can read the words and you end up with absolute nonsense um, so that every single amino acid is changed after that insertion mutation. So this is called a frame shift mutation and it also causes um, deleterious effects in most um, in most cells where that sort of mutation might occur. So there are a bunch of other kinds of mutations that we could talk about as well. There are um, deletions of entire sections of chromosomes. There are duplications and deletions of um, homologous chromosomes where you end up um, where certain part pieces are um, replicated within um, cells. So you end up with uh, two copies of the CD um, section of the chromosome in this in this mutant. Um, and in this mutant over here, there's actually, it's lost completely. So you can have sort of chromosome level mutations as well as individual codon level mutations. You can have translocations where entire pieces of chromosomes are shifted or switched between homologs. And you can have inversions where um, large portions of DNA are sort of cut out and then like turned uh, backwards so that the reading occurs backwards instead of forwards. And all of these different kinds of mutations can cause evolution in populations and they all count as a kind of mutations. These are more rare than the point mutations that I was discussing earlier. I'm not gonna get into great detail about the different sorts of mutations that occur in genomes. They're super interesting. And if you want to be a biologist studying genetics, or especially studying in um, evolutionary genetics, I would certainly pay attention to these sections of the textbook, but I'm not gonna ask you big detailed questions about how the different um, um, mutations occur and how rare each of them is. I do wanna talk for a second though about how um, and why mutations affect phenotypic evolution so rarely and so slowly. And a lot of this is based on um, the redundancy of the genetic code. Most mutations that occur, I'll say this one more time, are neutral, meaning they do not affect the phenotype of the mutant. So if they don't affect the phenotype, they also cannot affect the fitness of the, um, of the individual. So here we're talking about evolutionary change. It is genetic change in individuals, but it doesn't affect fitness or phenotype at all. So that's what I mean by neutral evolution. Evolution that doesn't cause adaptation, it doesn't harm individuals, and it doesn't hurt individuals either. It turns out that you know a whole lot of DNA in the genome does not code for functional proteins. Um, that means that there's a whole bunch of DNA that can accumulate mutations, but it doesn't actually matter because those mutations don't ever get encoded into proteins at all anyway. So those areas of DNA can accumulate, um, gradually accumulate more and more and more mutations over time, um, never causing any phenotypic differences, never causing any effects on fitness. It still counts as evolution and we can study it, but it doesn't cause um, the phenotypes to adapt to their environments. So that's one situation that you need to keep in mind. Secondly, there's a whole lot of redundancy in the genetic code. So even if there is a, co a 
portion of the DNA that it's um, incorporated into proteins, um, a lot of the um, changes in genetic code are um, buffered against the effects of mutation because there are redundancies. So for example, there are one, two, three, four different uh, co uh, triplet codons that all code for the same um, amino acid proline. So you could have a bit of RNA that says CCU or CCC or CCA or CCG. So you could have a mutation in any one of these third codons and you would get um, proline in the um, amino acid sequence. So many mutations would not cause any change in the protein sequence. Um, so that's another w reason why um, neutral um, um, mutations are so common. And a third reason why um, um, a third reason why uh, most mutations are neutral is that it turns out that even if amino acid sequences change, sometimes the changes don't matter. So, you know, proteins are really large molecules. They are made up of many, many amino acids, some of which are very important because they're um, uh, focused on the active site. The part of the protein is actually interacting with other uh, molecules in a cell or across the cells. Um, but there's actually a whole bunch of protein where it doesn't actually matter that much which exact amino acid is um, incorporated into the protein chain at that point. So even if the amino acid sequence is changed, sometimes that doesn't affect protein function. It doesn't affect protein function. It doesn't affect the phenotype of the organism. So these are all reasons why most mutations are neutral. And lastly, I want you to remember that even though mutations occur in every generation, and probably you have some mutations in your genome that are different from your parents, um, the mutation rate at any specific locus across a genotype is very low. And so evolutionary change by mutation alone is extremely slow. You can measure it though. So I wanna show you this. I love this. Um, this is kind of an overwhelming figure, but it's really great to look at once you understand what you're seeing. So this is a comparison of amino acid sequence over a whole bunch of different organisms, everywhere from humans at the um, top here, through kangaroos and chickens and dogfish, moths, and way down at the bottom here, are some plants, there's flies in the middle, there's some um, fungi here as well. So this is across the um, organisms um, from all different kinds of kingdoms. And what you see here sort of in the rows is the sequence of um, amino acids that makes up this protein, which is part of the cytochrome C gene, which is a very important protein for um, sort of oxidative respiration. So it's an important gene for um, for every living cell, basically, um, or every eukaryote anyway. Oh no, sorry, can you guys see that? All right, here we go, sorry. Um, so what you can see here is that there are sections of this gene that even though, um, you know, humans and uh, sesame plants and um, sunflowers and moths and turtles have been separated for millions and millions and millions of years, there are areas of this protein that are completely invariable. They have not been allowed to accumulate any kinds of mutations or change at all. So this is what we would guess. This section of the cytochrome C gene is probably where the active site, or at least one of the active sites, um, happens to be. And there are some other invariant areas around here as well. On the other hand, you can see that there are some amino acid locations where there has been more accumulation of different kinds of changes. So mutations have arisen and been incorporated into the genomes of these different organisms at some areas. You can see here there's a lot of variation um, across the taxa. Um, and here as well, um, there are differences between taxa in exactly what amino acid is incorporated at this specific location. So you can sort of look at how many mutations have occurred since two organisms have separated um, across time. And I think that's kind of interesting and cool to think about. We'll talk about that in a lab, in our last lab exercise actually in a couple of weeks.
Okay, I also wanted to uh, talk about the fact that, you know, it's possible sometimes to um, combine different evolutionary forces at once. So there's this idea of mutation selection balance. And mutation and selection act at the same time on the same organisms in population. So mutations can accumulate and selection can sort of weed out to some extent the less fit phenotypes. So there's this idea of a balance, the equilibrium between um, selection against a, um, uh, let's say deleterious mutation and the rate at which that new mutant allele arises by recurrent mutations. So it turns out that there are ways in which natural selection cannot eliminate um, disease causing alleles. So for example, um, we can have the, um, the idea of recessive mutations um, in large populations. So a recessive mutation, even if it is a deadly recessive mutation, such as the one that causes Tay-Sachs disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder, it's really sad and horrible, um, it is a deadly disorder. However, it keeps persisting in populations because selection can only act on it when it's homozygous. Um, when it's heterozygous, that mutation can be completely masked or completely sort of covered up by a functional wild type allele. So Tay-Sachs kind of hangs around at low frequencies in populations, um, even though it's fatal in some in the homozygous condition. So that's one way where selection um, allows mutations to sort of hang around in populations, despite the fact that they can be fatal in the homozygous condition. A second way that natural selection cannot completely eliminate disease causing alleles is a situation where you have even a dominant um, disease causing allele that would be selected against, but the effects of that allele don't show up until the post reproductive years. So it's another really horrible, sad situation in human populations. Um, where a disease, for example, Huntington's disease, which again causes um, degeneration and you know a great deal of, of pain and difficulty and eventually death, but it usually does not occur until individuals are in their 30s or 40s after they've already reproduced. So if a mutation does not um, show itself in the phenotype until after reproduction, then selection cannot act to eliminate or at least fully eliminate that disorder. To some extent, actually, that might be changing in populations where um, a lot of genetic counseling occurs, but um, for the moment, um, diseases like Huntington's disease, which are autosomal dominant disorders, so they, they can cause um, very hurtful effects on the phenotype um, of even heterozygotes, um, they don't get eliminated because they don't show up until later in the, in the, um, in the life cycle of the individual carrying it. And the final way that I want to talk about where selection does not eliminate disease causing alleles is in sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a case where there is an allele that is fatal when it's homozygous because it causes um, deadly anemia or the inability to carry oxygen in blood cells um, or carbon dioxide for that matter. But um, in the heterozygous case, those individuals who have um, the heterozygous phenotype for the sickle cell allele tend to have a great deal of resistance to um, other kinds of um, diseases which are infectious diseases. For example, a, a malaria, which is caused by a plasmodium um, carried by mosquitoes. So in this case, we are dealing with a um, heterozygous uh, individual who might have higher fitness and um, therefore um, the allele causing sickle cell anemia, which is deadly in the homozygous case and helpful in the heterozygous case, that allele is maintained in populations that have um, high frequencies of malaria in the environment. So mutation and selection sort of working together come up with some really interesting and um, sort of 
uh, intriguing issues, especially in medicine, actually. Um, all right, and I think that might be all I want to say about mutation right now, so I'm going to pause and I'm going to start a different video for um, gene flow.